Hi friends, as part of Civil Sphere, today we will be seeing five topics. Under the prelims topics, we will be seeing Tatraj Imuna Link Canal, then the Salikonia Crop, and Kaleshwaram Project. Under the editorial discussions, we will be seeing Sunlight and Shadow, a recent article on the amendments to RTA Act, and then the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act 2012. Coming to our first topic, it is the Satlej Emuna Link Canal. And from the figure, you can see this is the Satlej River, and here you have the Emuna River, and this is the Yamuna Canal. This line it shows the Satlej Emuna Link Canal. It's a 240 kilometer long canal of which around 122 kilometers is in the state of Punjab and around 92 kilometers is in the state of Haryana. Now, when Haryana was separated from Punjab in 1966, there was a lot of water problems that the state faced. To address all these problems, in 1981, a water sharing agreement was concluded between the states. And in 1982, the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi inaugurated the construction of this project. As of now, the canal in the Haryana portion, it is completed, but the project is still incomplete in Punjab portion. Uh, Punjab was supposed to finish this project by 1991, but due to some local political issues and the killing of the super engineers who were supervising the project, the uh, uh, canal is still uh, not completed. Now, the crisis seriously started in 2004 when Punjab government enacted a legislation known as termination of agreements, unilaterally cancelling the water sharing agreement. This, uh, uh, this issue was later taken up in the Supreme Court and Supreme Court gave its verdict that it was an unconstitutional legislation. But again in 2016, Punjab passed another legislation to restore the land which was acquired for the canal. So if you see this entire project, there is a lot of controversies surrounding this project and it requires immense political will to solve these problems and to complete this project. Now the main objectives of this project, it was to address the irrigational problems faced by the semi-arid regions of Haryana as well as providing irrigational facilities to Punjab. Also if the project is completed, the inland water transportation inland water transportation in this region will be increased. Also, in terms of power, it is expected to generate 52 megawatt of electricity from two powerhouses along the Satlej, link, Satlej Yamuna link canal. That's all about this. Coming to our next topic, it is the Salicornia Corp. This is the image of Salicornia crop. There was a recently an article in Hindu that Salicornia crop was documented along the coast of Krishna district in Andhra Pradesh. Coming to the crop, it is a succulent bushy plant find in the salty terrains of coastal regions. And you can see it is a halophyte flowering plant in the family of Amaranthasia. So halophyte, you know that they are uh, plants that grow in salty soil. So coming to the commercial benefits of this plant, it has so many commercial benefits. The main one being its seeds provide edible oil, quality edible oil. We can extract quality edible oil from its seed, uh, seeds. Also, its leaves and stem can be cooked and eaten and can be served as salads. That's why it is known as the, known by the name as sea asparagus. Also, the, it is a good fodder for cattle and is also used as a raw material in the paper industry. Now, coming to the most important commercial benefit, if the plant, if this salicornia crop is dried and undergone various process, we can extract salt from it. And the salt extracted from this plant will be, will contain lower sodium. So it will have a lower sodium content. And this lower sodium content salt can be especially useful for patients who have hypertension, uh, diabetes, and other gastric ailments. So these are some of the commercial benefits of salicornia crop. Moving to our next topic, it is Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project of Telangana. 
before delving into the details of this project, we will just see what is lift irrigation. So it's a method of irrigation in which water is not transported through its natural flow, but it is lifted by pumps and other pools to the delivery chamber. <laughs> now coming to the project, it is said to be one of the biggest irrigational projects of the world. And you know that in Telangana, it is the uh, second highest, it has the second highest number of farmer suicides. Uh, where the first one is the Vidarbha region of Maharashtra. So this project has the potential to address the problems, the water was faced by the state and its farmers. Now, if you see, it is built on the river Godavari and its tributaries. From Pilim's perspective, you have to know the tributaries of Godavari, both left and right bank tributaries. Now, coming to the unique features of this project. It is one of the costliest irrigation project ever undertaken by a state in our country. Also, this project covers the entire Telangana state. And apart from providing irrigational benefits, it has, it will provide drinking water to so many cities and towns along the, uh, along this project and also uh, water to industries in many parts of the state. Now, if you see, the entire project is a complex, it has so many complex features of water reservoirs, water tunnels, and pumping systems and all. And it has a capacity to store water of um, around 148 MCT and can lift at least two MCT of water every day. So if you see, one MCT, it is equal to 28.8 3 billion liters of water. So this is a massive amount of water. To lift this much water every day, you need an efficient pumping system. And this project has one of the biggest underground, underground pumping station. And it uses one of the highest capacity of pumps to pump this much water. So these are some of the features of Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project. Moving to our next topic, sunlight and shadow. Uh, this was a recent article in the Hindu newspaper about the amendments to the RTI Act. We will see what is the RTI Act, then the Central Information Commission, what are the proposed amendments. So coming to the RTI Act, you know it was enacted in 2005. This act provides the right to information to the citizens. That means the citizens can assess information which is under the control of a public authority. And the main objective of this act was to empower the citizens by informing them what the government is doing. So it helped in curtailing or it helped in reducing corruption in the government as well as it it helped in empowering the citizens and making and bringing more transparency and accountability in the working of the public authorities. This act covers the entire country of India except Jammu and Kashmir because Jammu and Kashmir has their own legislation for addressing these problems. Now, any person in India can file an RTI by going to the online website of RTI online dot gov dot in. So coming to Central Information Commission. This was established by the central government under the provisions of RTI Act of 2005. And you know, it is not a constitutional body, but an high powered independent body. And CIC consists of one chief information commissioner and information commissioners not more than 10. And they are appointed by president on the recommendation of a committee. And this committee consists of the prime minister, the leader of opposition in Lok Sabha, and one union cabinet minister who is uh, nominated by the prime minister. Then coming to the eligibility of this uh, uh, information commissioners, uh, they should not be a member of parliament or a member of legislative assembly nor they should, uh, they, they, should, they should not hold an office of profit and should not be associated with any political parties. Their tenure is five years or attaining 65 years of age. And they are not eligible for reappointment. Now, the salary allowances and other service condition of uh, information commissioners is similar to that of 
chief election commissioner and the election commissioner. You know the salary allowances and service conditions of CEC is similar to that of Supreme Court judges. So if you see the status of CIC and ICs are in the case of salary allowances and service conditions is similar to CEC and in that case it is equal to the Supreme Court judges. Now coming to the proposed amendment. In the proposed amendment, the central government is seeking to control the tenure, salary and allowances of information commissioners. This, if this amendment is passed, it will do away with the parity given to ICs with respect to CEC in case of salary and allowances. And this will seriously affect the independence of the working of information commissioners. Now, if you see, there is a lot of challenges associated with the working of RTI Act. Like there is a lack of manpower, a lot of vacancies are to be filled, and then piling up of appeals in information commissions, and then the section four. Section four of RTI Act envisage that the public uh, authorities, the public departments, they, they publish the information regarding the office um, in Suvomoto. In such cases, if the, if the information is published on their own, there is no need to, no need for the citizens to uh, file an RTI application. But most, uh, mostly the uh, public authority does not complain to this section. Now, when a person is filing an RTI application, most, uh, most of the time the officers will be giving an incomplete, vague or unconnected information. But in that case also, the officers are not uh, punished or penalized under RTI Act. So these are some of the major lacunas in the uh, in the working of RTI Act. So if an amendment is brought, it should address these serious challenges. But if you see the present proposal, it it it, it does not un address any of this challenge. Instead, it seeks to undermine the real motive of RTI Act. So that much is about this particular editorial. Coming to our last topic, it is the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act 2012. We will see the objectives of this act, what are the major provisions, now what are the proposals for amendment and its impact. Coming to the act, as you see from, as you, as you can see from the name of the act, it is to protect children from offences like sexual abuse, sexual harassment, pornography, etc. And the act defines a child as a person below 18 years. Also, if you see, there are a lot of, um, lot of provisions regarding to the trial and how the uh, recordings has to be done in this. And the act defines what sexual abuse is. It also includes penetrative and non-penetrative assault. And in some circumstances, the assault is termed as uh, aggravated. Where especially when if the child is mentally ill or if the offender or the abuser, uh, abuser, abuser is from any security forces or armed forces or they are related to the child or they are a, a public servant like a teacher, a doctor or anybody like that. In such circumstances, the case is referred as an aggravated assault. Now coming to the uh, trial portion, the act uh, recommends that the trial should be completed within one year. And also the evidence of the child should be recorded within 30 days. The entire process of the trial should be recorded in camera and should be conducted in the presence of the uh, parents or someone to whom the child has trust. Now it also, uh, it also includes uh, stringent punishments to the, um, punishments to the abuser and it de the punishment depends on the gravity of the crime. Now coming to the amendments. Recently, the Ministry of Women and Child Development brought some proposals for amendments to this act. And the proposals are, first one is to increase the punishment to uh, those convicted in cases, uh, in cases of sexual assault against young boys. And the second one was to award death penalty to those convicted in cases of rape of children below 12 years. So these are the two amendments proposed by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. And if you see the first one, 
uh, it is enhancing the pri enhancing the punishment given to those who are involved in the sexual abuse of young boys this brings a gender neutrality gender neutrality to the law so especially in india uh, the male child abuse is uh, is not much talked about and is not br brought into the mainstream media so this particular provision if it passed it will address the problems faced by young boys and uh, their child uh, their sexual abuse cases now coming to the death penalty it is not sure whether it will, this death penalty awarding death penalty will act as a deterrent uh, to uh, the de uh, deterrent against the sexual offenses but if you see uh, now the punishment for uh, rape and uh, murder has become the same so uh, it may become in the future it may become a problem for the victims because it is the uh, testimony of the victim that serves as the biggest evidence against uh, the offender so there is a chance that they may be um, they may be murdered by the um, offender so these are the amendments and now if you see this act if you see the entire act it has some pious goals and it considers the welfare of the children but along with such stringent punishment we have to take several steps to uh, address the problem of rape culture in our country so steps like age appropriate sex education at all levels then had taking advertisement campaigns about sexual abuse talking about uh, or st stimulating conversations about gender bias in daily life and then there should be a concerted effort to change the way the society raises its sons and daughters so by bringing all these things and having such a law we can address the problem of rape culture in our country so that is all about today's topics thank you for your time